right now, we are facing in some ways at least a double whammy. You know, there is COVID-19 that is driving fear in all of our communities, not just the Asian American community, all of our communities. And that fear causes a certain level of emotions. But then number two is the real geopolitical uh, discussions that are happening, the tensions between the United States and China. You know, it is absolutely correct to say that the Chinese government is doing some awful things. You know, whether we are talking about Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region, whether we are talking about free press in Hong Kong, or just the general surveillance state that exists in mainland China, there are legitimate disputes between the Chinese government and the United States government. But what we don't want is all of that to bleed over into the Chinese American society or the Asian American society writ large. And that is what we see happening, is when the president uses words like Chinese virus, Kung flu, and most recently at the presidential debate, China plague, that has a ripple effect, a real direct effect on all Asian Americans, not just Chinese Americans, all Asian Americans here in, in the country. What we have seen, our organization likewise has a, a website that tracks hate incidents that allows people to tell stories about hate incidents that they have encountered. What we have seen is that that language has translated into actions by certain individuals, actions in the form of racist incidents, epithets, and outright violence at times. In, in fact, the ADL just put out a report, ADL being the Anti-Defamation League, they just put out a report this morning uh, tracking online hate and showing spikes in online hate directed at Asian Americans after the president used the term China plague and when other high ranking officials have used these types of derogatory terms. This is not about word semantics. This is not about political correctness. This is about real life consequences that happen as a result of this language, this fear that we are seeing. You know, there are certainly policy issues that we could present, well, such as the Jabera uh, Higher No Hate Act that Congress is trying to get passed right now, that offers some additional tools to how we can respond to, to hate. Now, there are policies that state and local governments can offer, essentially to provide victim services, among other things. Those are also pieces we need to look at. But then we also need to look at how do we also empower our own community during this time. One of the things that our organization is doing, again, I don't want to profess any sort of monopoly, a number of organizations are starting to do this, is what's called bystander intervention training, giving people in the community uh, the tools to respond to these incidents if they're in a position that they're physically safe to do so. So what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is, you know, if you see someone that is becoming a victim of hate, let's say on a subway where racial epithets are being thrown at this, at this victim. You know, what is it that you can do? There's, there's many little things that can be do that can have real consequences. You know, it's a, it may be as simple as dropping your keys so that it distracts people and kind of reduces the level of, of tension that, that is there. If you are in a position that you feel comfortable doing it, you could say to that, that aggressor, hey, stop that, that is inappropriate behavior. You could also just help that victim and get close to that victim and give them a knowing look and just move them to a safe space or take them to the next station if, if, if it's on a subway. All of these acts makes a big difference. In fact, I had a conversation just two days ago with a person that was the victim of a physical assault. This was not in the last few months, but several years ago. And he was just saying, it would have just been so helpful to him if even someone just gave him a knowing look, just a sympathetic look to know that he was not alone when he was getting assaulted in that way. And so that's one of the things that we could also teach our community, teach all communities about, is how to do, respond in a way that shows some empathy, that gives us a little bit of power to take back the situation. There's, there's a community that's working together on all of this. You know, all of us have worked together in various different ways, and that energy that is building off of this negativity is something that, that we should regard as a positive and that we need to continue to push forward on. It really pains me that when Representative Meng introduced a resolution to condemn anti-Asian hate, over, uh, not over, 164 Republicans opposed that resolution. And there was no good reason given except that, well, the resolution specifically called out President Trump. 
we need to get beyond that. And, and unfortunately, we need to get to a, we we are in a position right now that people, you know, some people are just unwilling to go against the rest of their party or the rest of their group that they talk to to condemn racism. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. We can have our policy differences and, and we should, but when we see racism, we have to speak out about that. Now, one thing I would caution everyone about, though, is that this is going to extend beyond election day. Even if Joe Biden wins the presidency, these issues will not go away because the tensions between the real tensions between the governments between the United States and China and some of these issues are going to remain, number one. And this white violent extremism that has been unleashed in this last four years has, is not going to go away. So we should not let our guard down even if the election brings it brings changes to the federal policymakers or even some state policymakers, that this issue is going to continue. We need to be vigilant and talk about this in a thoughtful way. So early in 2020, uh, we began to see the emergence of COVID-19 related hate against our communities. Um, and I wanted to share with you three examples that are emblematic of what we saw in those first uh, few months, that is really between sort of February um, and um, June of 2020. Um, the first example on the left is elderly parents or grandparents who are walking their grandchild um, in the neighborhood when uh, a group of 20 to 30 year olds came by, drove by and screamed racial epithets at them. Of course, they were nervous, upset, and anxious, uh, and felt very unsafe. The middle example is a violation of a uh, civil rights law, which is a ride hailing company refusing to pick up um, someone who is Asian American or Pacific Islander. Um, and again, um, yelling um, racial and racist comments. And then the last example is one that we uh, here in LA worked on, which was of a middle school child who was physically attacked and verbally assaulted, uh, essentially for being Asian American. He was accused of having COVID-19 and uh, by a bully at the school and told to go back to China. And so when the child responded that he was not Chinese, um, unfortunately he was punched in the head 20 times by the bully um, and no action was immediately taken uh, during that time by the school administration. So these are just a few of the examples, next slide, that um, resulted in um, APCON getting together with Chinese for Affirmative Action in San Francisco State University, both in the Bay Area, um, to work on uh, COVID-19 related hate against our communities. Uh, we launched a reporting center on March 19th of this year. And we found that right away we began to get uh, literally hundreds of incident reports that were uh, reported firsthand by individuals who had experienced them. We believe that came as a result of our being trusted sources in the AAPI community with over a hundred years of experience combined. Our form is available in multiple languages. You see those here. Um, so we make sure that even individuals who are limited English speaking can access our forms and report incidents that have happened to them. We've also done a significant outreach to LEP communities and immigrant communities. Um, and our reports are available uh, on the APCON website, but we are slowly migrating all of them to our Stop AAPI Hate website, both of which um, you can access today. Next slide. So right away, we began collecting data um, with our researchers uh, at SF State and now at many other universities. And so we found that um, in 29 weeks, um, over we received over 2,700 incident reports from across the country. Um, as John mentioned, most of these um, that we've seen and other organizations have seen are hate incidents and not hate crimes. And that's really important for us to remember as we look at remedies and policy solutions. The incidents um, for us come from 45 states in the District of Columbia, 
56 percent um, involve or come from um, the states of California and New York. Uh, women experience hate at a rate 2.3 uh, times that of men and 7% of respondents are seniors. So what does this tell us? <clears throat> One, that these incidents are widespread. There, no part of the country is immune. Um, but we know that, of course, um, significant percentage come from those places that have large populations of AAPIs. We also know that targeted, or sorry, vulnerable uh, community members are targeted. And so it's no surprise understanding the Me Too movement that women are experiencing much more hate and harassment than men, um, and that seniors also are being uh, targeted. At a significant percentage are, um, of individuals who've been targeted are Chinese American. Uh, and not surprisingly, the other one uh, next is Korean Americans. So what we find in our data is that those individuals who are perceived um, to be uh, East Asian or perceived to be Chinese Americans are the ones that are hit most hard. You know, what's very concerning is that a uh, significant percentage happen at private businesses. So these include um, retail outlets, grocery stores, um, pharmacies, big box retail. And that was especially concerning um, uh, during shelter in place when there were very few uh, venues we could go to and the ones that we needed to go to as, uh, as all Americans to get um, necessary supplies, to get food, to get medications. Um, so this continues to be of concern to us. Similarly, we look at public streets, public parks, um, and um, uh, public transit, and those also are places where uh, uh, quite a large number of incidents are happening. And then, of course, at schools. We don't expect a significant change after the election. And our lesson here is from 9-11. When you look at what happened and we lost 3,000 American lives uh, in 2001, and yet um, Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and Sikh communities experienced a backlash more than 10 years, some of which uh, continues to be with us today, both in terms of hate crimes and hate incidents, and also in terms of policies that target and profile those communities. We are at the 210,000 fatality mark. And so we believe, unfortunately, this violence is gonna be with us for uh, at least a decade. About four in 10 Americans say it is more common to express racist views about people who are Asian than before the coronavirus outbreak. This is much more towards Asians than those who are Hispanic, whites, and black. And black also is very high as well. There's been an increase, but Asian Americans in particular has had the highest increase since the coronavirus outbreak. Next slide. And when we actually break the, um, the data looking at um, people by, by a racial group, a racial ethnic group, we find that Asians in particular are reporting that um, the highest in terms of 39% of, of the Asian sample say that people have been um, more, has acted more uncomfortable around them since the coronavirus outbreak. Also, there's been an increase of, of um, been subject to racial slurs or jokes. Um, this is 31% for Asians compared to other groups, much higher than everyone else. And also Asian Americans have also feared someone might threaten or physically attack them. And this is much more, 26% of Asian Americans have, have reported that there's been an increase compared to other um, racial ethnic groups. Next slide. And now we've partisan. We know John Yang talked about this earlier there is a big partisan um, debate about even about mask wearing. As we already know what happened the past week with mask wearing, we know that uh, masks, especially partisans, has been big split. But here are some about racial breaks. Looking at, um, well, from partisan standpoint, we know that more Democrats and Republicans say they wore masks in stores all or most of the time. And when you look at groups, um, Asian Americans in particular have the most in terms of are, are wearing um, a mask or face covering in stores, and, and as well as Hispanics and Blacks, much more than um, those who are white. Next slide. And also, when we um, look at um, being, because there's a lot of mask wearing, um, those who are Black and Asian adults 
are also more likely than white and Hispanic adults to worry about people being suspicious if they're wearing a mask. So you see that Asians and Black Americans are more likely to worry that others will be suspicious of them. And we already know from the previous slide that Asian Americans and Black Americans are more likely to wear more masks than other racial groups. So this is, this is an interesting um, data point. Next slide. And this is a question we really, um, people have anecdotal, um, people think that um, are wondering is, is President Trump making race relations worse or, or is there progress um, towards um, improving? We see that the general public, um, roughly half of Americans have said Trump has made race relations worse, but this is broken by, by race. You could see that Asian, Blacks and Hispanics uh, majority uh, have said that President Trump has made it worse. And then you see a big, wide partisan split where 80% of Democrats or leading Democrats believe that President Trump has made it worse, whereas Republicans and leading Republicans are only about 40%. And 32% of Republicans actually say that um, Trump has tried but failed to make progress on race relations. Next slide. And now when we're looking at the Black Lives Matter movement. We had to, we asked this question right in the midst of when George the um, episode and protest um, around George Floyd was happening in early June. So, um, as we know from earlier episodes, when we had this um, back in I mean in the '90s, when everyone was worried that would there be some anti-Asian hate even within uh, among Black American community, um, we see here that actually there's quite support even among Asian Americans towards the Black Lives Matter movement. You see that most Americans express support for Black Lives Matter, and you can see that Asians about 75% strongly support or somewhat support um, the Black Lives Matter movement. The focus here is showing that there has been increase of, of, of um, discrimination towards Asian Americans and Black Americans since the coronavirus happened. The part of the problem is we don't know whether there's a rise or a drop in, in white supremacist activity because nobody uh, actually tracks white supremacist violence. Uh, the government doesn't track white supremacist violence. Uh, so there's no objective uh, criteria for counting uh, and accounting for uh, the rise and fall. You know, typically you have private entities uh, that try to collect this violence, but or try to collect data about this violence, but what they're actually recording is media reports of this violence. And the media reports typically follow the police reports. And what we know is that the police are uh, uh, reluctant to work many of these cases. For hate crimes, for example, uh, the, the data that's usually uh, referenced in media reports is the uniform crime reports. But we know that only 12.6% of, of law enforcement agencies actually acknowledge that hate crimes occur within their jurisdiction. So we're talking about a very narrow subset of the actual crime problem. And on the other side of that, the, the uh, Justice Department does national crime victim surveys, uh, which indicate there are about 230,000 hate crimes each year, half of which are not reported to law enforcement for various reasons. Uh, but the law enforcement agencies that report to the um, uniform crime reports only report about 8,000 hate crimes a year. The federal government has five federal hate crime statutes, but only prosecutes about 25 defendants each year. So the, quite a disparity there. And not that I think that, that a victim's uh, uh, belief that the crime was racially or ethnically motivated necessarily uh, will always comport with the facts. Uh, that are accessible to law enforcement. But, you know, we have somewhere between 25 and 230,000 hate crimes each year. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty wide gap. Um, and so uh, typically what, what I have seen <clears throat> since I worked these cases in the 1990s is that for whatever reason, there will be uh, attention brought to these groups and then law enforcement will start to focus on them and the media will start to focus on them and the public will become concerned about them. And then there's a lot of reporting that later gets called a, a rise in this violence when what we have to understand is this violence is, is persistent throughout time. Um, and what we have to uh, 
understand is, is that law enforcement doesn't focus on this as a matter of course. In fact, today, the FBI could not tell you how many people white supremacists killed last year uh, or the year before that or the year before that. They could tell you how many bank robberies happened. They could tell you how many bank robberies involved the use of a weapon and which involved the use of a note. They could tell you whether there was a getaway driver in every bank robbery, but they can't tell you how many people white supremacists killed because they don't go out and cap collect that data. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, and and part of the problem is that uh, th there are if a white supremacist kills somebody, there are, are basically four ways that that could be addressed. That could be treated as <clears throat> a domestic an act of domestic terrorism, uh, in which case <clears throat> it would be the FBI's number one priority, uh, and and there would be a broad investigation trying to identify like-minded individuals that may have played a role in that crime <clears throat> and the conspiracy. Uh, it could be uh, described as a hate crime. And if the FBI treats it as a hate crime, it drops down to the number fifth priority. Uh, it's a civil rights violation. Uh, and the case would be worked specifically to determine the motivation for that crime. So it would be very individually focused. Um, and uh, that's if the FBI investigated it at all, because the Justice Department policy is to defer uh, hate crime prosecutions to state and local law enforcement, which of course we know from the Uniform Crime Reports, most state and local agencies don't work these cases. So it, it could disappear into the ether. Uh, the FBI actually prosecutes most of its cases targeting white supremacists through its violent crimes program, uh, which treats them as gangs. Uh, and of course, the other murders happen that never come to the FBI's attention and they get treated as murders. And if the police don't identify it as a white supremacist murder, there's nothing for the press to write about. Uh, so uh, a lot of the violence that these groups perpetrate is sort of lost in, in the lack of reporting and accounting for this uh, violence. But certainly over the last several years, we have seen increased attention to white supremacist activity and white supremacist violence. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that we had a presidential candidate who was making racist statements uh, that seemed to um, be something that would appeal to these groups. You know, unfortunately, I, I, I think some of the reporting uh, contributed to the problem because uh, what you have to understand about these groups is there's no barrier to entry. You can call yourself the leader of whatever state you're in, militia, and you're it, right? If you have a piece of paper, you can write your name and under it, Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan for my local community, and you are the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan for your local community. Nobody's going to come around and say you're not. Uh, and you might have zero followers, but if some major media outlet uh, looks up your website and finds it and then goes out and interviews you as the grand dragon of the local Ku Klux Klan, all of a sudden you're going to find your phone ringing, right? The communities typically targeted by hate crimes don't have good relationships with the police. They're, they're the, the communities that are often improperly targeted by the police. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, and they don't trust the police. They don't want the police to come into their neighborhood, so they're not going to call them. Um, you know, no mayor wants to be the, the town, the state leader in uh, hate crimes, right? So when your police commissioner comes to you and says, hey, look at all these hate crimes we're going to report. No, we're trying to get some multinational company to, to build a factory here. We don't want to be known as the hate crime capital of the world. So there's a lot of good reasons why the police don't report. 